wonderful to be here this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Danny. That was my wife earlier, uh, Lori, who was uh, doing announcements, and we're just part of the pastoral team here and blessed to be a part. Um, if you're willing, I like to pray with everyone as we get started, so uh, if you'd be willing to say this simple prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I'm asking you to speak to me. I open up my heart. I open up my ears, and I choose to receive from your word and from your spirit. I want to be challenged. I want to be changed. I want to fall more in love with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's what it's all about, falling more in love with him. I want to open this morning with a uh, passage out of uh, Mark chapter 10. And it's a very familiar one, but we're going to uh, kind of break it down a little bit this morning. And uh, starting in verse 17, it reads as follows, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Now, now here's what's interesting. If, if you're reading in, in uh, Luke chapter 18, it says that it wasn't just a young ruler, he was a writ, or it says he was a ruler, but he was a rich young ruler. So not only was he rich, not only was he in a position of authority, but from the sounds of it, he feels like he's lived a pretty good life. He's a good person, right? And he says, so all of these I've kept since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he said this, one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And at this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, what I want to kind of pull out of this story is something that I think is going to apply to every one of us because when I read this, I see me. Because it's pretty pretty easy to notice when there's lack. We're actually very good at noticing lack. We know in the morning when we've not had our caffeine, right? <laughs> we, uh, we know when we've missed a meal and it's time to eat. Well, at least most people do. I forget sometimes. But, you know, uh, we know when we're, we're lacking strength. We know when we're lacking finances. Um, it's pretty easy f- for some of those things. But we also know when we go to a restaurant when service is lacking, or when we're not getting our, our money's worth, or, or those types of things. But we also, unfortunately, are way better at noticing what's lacking in everybody else's life. It's amazing. You could sit down, and whether it was your spouse you were talking about, your parents you were talking about, your kids you were talking about, your neighbor you were talking about, that politician that you see, that guy at work, Man, if they would just change one thing, (laughs) actually for a lot of them, it's if they would just change a couple of things, right? So that shows that we have the ability to see when there's lack. But in this story, you have this rich young girl, he's trying to do all this stuff, but he's not seeing what's missing in his own life. He's looking at his own life and only seeing the good. He's not able for some reason to see what he's actually lacking. And Jesus makes a statement. He says, one thing you lack. Now, it's kind of interesting because there's kind of two definitions of the word thing. It's either you don't know what to name it or call it. You don't know what it is. There's this thing. I I, I don't know what it is. Or you know what it is, but you don't want to give it a name. (laughs) And so that, that, that's, that's kind of the definition of, you know, the word thing. So here we have the rich young ruler, and he's coming to Jesus 
because there's this thing missing in his life. He's trying to do good. He's trying to do these things that are right. And fortunately, he actually goes to the right place. He goes to Jesus and he says, what am I missing? What's going on? Help me. I want eternal life. There's something missing. And Jesus says, all right, there's one thing, one thing that you lack. Now, I kind of got a hypothetical question for you. Do you really think there was only one thing in that guy's life? You really think he was perfect except for one thing? I think this was the one big thing. (laughs) This was the one major hindrance between him and God. This was the one thing that was holding him back from eternal life. And Jesus called him out on it. But I, again, wonder why when we go through life and we, and we get to that place where we know there's something missing, why, why we don't go to God and ask? Because he actually did the right thing. He went to the right place. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only one who... who Every now and then has one of those days where you're like, what is going on with me? It's like, I just don't, I don't feel right. I, I, like, like there's something missing. I don't feel like I'm, you know, cruising on all six cylinders or whatever, you, <laughs> whatever your analogy wants to be. But I just, I don't feel like I'm really at, at my potential. I don't feel like I'm living with purpose. I don't feel like I have joy. I, I don't feel like I have peace. There's, there's something missing. There's something going on. Now, on the, on the screen, you see a missing puzzle piece. And uh, my daughter got married a little over a year ago, and as a gift, she sent us a picture of our family as a puzzle. You go ahead and show it there. And so there's our family as a puzzle. Now, for a moment, I was like, wow, I'm famous. <laughs> I'm on a puzzle. <laughs> right? And so I started you know, putting this puzzle together, and it was kind of like, you know, exhilarating, like, I want to get this done, I want to get this done, and and I'm looking at this puzzle, and I'm putting it together, and the more I looked at it, the more I realized I was looking at myself, and then it was, it was kind of weird, and then it's like, are my ears really like that, or is that, (laughs) or is that the line in the puzzle, or is that, is my, Am I really that disproportionate? Am I, are my, you know, and you start, the more you look at it, the more you're like, okay, something's not right. (laughs) You know, it's like, it's not easy to just look at yourself outwardly. And then we get all the way, like, towards the end, and there was one piece missing. One piece. After all the hours we put into it, I'm like, are you serious? There's a missing piece. What are we going to do? We need a new puzzle. This is not acceptable. We can't have a puzzle that's not complete. There's like a void. I think it might have even been down around my kneecap or something. I was like, this is not good. We got to finish the puzzle. It's got to be complete. It just didn't feel right to leave it the way it was. So, you know, I made sure we didn't drop it somewhere and all that kind of stuff. So my daughter ordered us a new puzzle. And so we got a new puzzle and I had to look at myself again and again And those lines this time were in a different place. (laughs) I'm like, no, that's got to be where the lines are again, right? But no. So it was kind of weird. But here's the deal. James chapter 1, verses 23 and 24 says this. It says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and then after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. I actually had to walk away from the puzzle because I didn't like what I looked like. Just saying. I'm aging. There's things going on. I'm not, you know, it's like this natural process is happening. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. It's hard to look at myself. It really is. I look at myself in the mirror enough to get out of the mirror. And make sure there's nothing awkward and weird. Do I, you know, I'm at that age where do I have like any really long hairs coming out of certain parts of my face that shouldn't be coming out of my face that I need to get rid of? Or, you know, like I try and take care of some of those things, but, you know, is my hair sticking straight up? Or, no, okay, it's, 
But other than that, I'm like, I'm out of here. I can be in and out of the bathroom, no time flat. But here's the deal. It's not just about what we look like outwardly. You see, there's so many times, even like church, we come to church or we do our devotions and we get in the word. And we go and we hear or we see, and the Holy Spirit resonates something in our heart like, oh, that's me. Man, that's something that's ugly in my life. I need to take care of that. I need to change that. I need to fix that. And we get up from our devotions, or we get up from church, and we walk out the door, and we do nothing. And the Bible says that's like forgetting what you look like. Completely forgetting what you look like. But here's the deal. Proverbs 27, 19 says this. It says, as water reflects the face, so your life actually reflects your heart. So as much as I didn't like looking at the outward appearance of my face on a puzzle, if I would actually look at my life as a whole, I will get a very clear picture as to what's going on inside of me. You see, sometimes we overcomplicate things. Our life is a reflection of what's going on inside. If you don't feel right, if you feel like something's missing, if you feel like there's a hole or a void or something, all you got to do is look in the mirror of your life. How are my relationships with people? How's my attitude? How, how, how's my time with the Lord? How's my relationship with my spouse? How's my relationship with my friends? How's the way I drive? I mean, there's, there's a lot of things you can figure out by, by l- looking at your life. How's my attitude with my employer? You see, when you start to look at your life, how late do I sleep in? How much do I even work? How do I spend my money? There's a lot of things you can see about yourself if you're willing to look. But if you're not willing to look, then you're never going to know. But here's the deal. I believe the rich young ruler was actually looking. He was actually looking at his life. He was looking at the the things he was doing, the way he was treating people. He actually lined out all these different things. These are the things I'm trying to do. I'm looking, I'm analyzing my life, but yet there's still something missing. So the starting place, when you feel that void or that, you know, unsettled, like I'm not where I'm supposed to be, I'm not feeling fulfilled, is to look at your life. But if you can't see it or you can't figure it out, You could actually ask your spouse. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) You can do exactly what the rich young ruler did. He went straight to Jesus. He went straight to the Lord. So as I kind of go through this process this morning, I don't want you to be thinking about anybody else. It's so easy to listen to a message and think about your spouse's flaws or somebody else's flaws. Think about my flaws. No, we're not going there today. That's not the purpose of this message. I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to self-reflect and allow Him to shine His loving light into our life so we can see what that one thing is that's missing. Now, unfortunately, the rich young ruler went to the right person and in all honesty, he even came in the right position. He, it says he came and he knelt down. He humbled himself before Jesus. So he went to the right person. He came with the right heart motive in one sense where he, he was acknowledging God for who he is and he just wasn't willing to make the right decision. He just wasn't willing to take what he heard Jesus speaking to him and do something about it. I think we should be willing to give up everything for the Lord. But I don't think we should give up the Lord for anything. And that's where the rich young ruler was. He was willing to give up the Lord 
for money. But there's a principle there that I think we can all learn from it. So how, how do we make sure that we don't end up in the same position as him? How do we make sure that we don't end up missing out on the life, both on this earth and eternal life, that God has for us? Well, I think there's a couple of things that, that we can learn, and here's the first one. There's only one thing that you need to do. One thing that you need to do, and that's you need to go to the Lord. You need to go to God. And you need to go to God on His terms, not on yours. That's what it means to humble yourself before God. So many times we go to God with the wrong motives, the, you know, the, the wrong concepts. Mark 10, 17, I already read it, says that um, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and he fell on his knees before him. So there was this connection that was happening. And I was trying to think of this process, and, I, and I'm going to need someone to help me here. Um, Zach, will you come up here for a second? It's, it's good. You get to be Jesus. You get to be Jesus this morning. If you just stand right here. So Zach represents Jesus. And the one thing you need to do is go to Jesus. But here's what most of us kind of wrestle with. Kind of like the rich young ruler, we start looking at our life. And we're like, well, of course I go to Jesus because I love worship. I worship all the time. K-Love is playing all the time in my car. I love worship music. But you see, so many times, our idea of worship actually isn't even about Jesus. It's about the songs we like, the music we like, the time we like. There's a lot of Christians who worship worship music, when really, worship music is all about Him. So you think you're going to God, but really, you're just going to that one thing that gives you peace. Oh, if I just play worship music, I just feel at peace. No, worship music is all about him. And he's the one that we're supposed to worship. So we go to him. So just be, now, worship is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I love worship. I'm a worshiper with a bad voice. I'm a worshiper all the time. I'm administered to by worship all the time. But I understand that worship is not about me. Worship is about him. So when I worship, I go to him. So make sure you don't get that confused. Or sometimes it's, I go to church. <laughs> I go to church. I'm not feeling good. It's like, man, stuff's not good in my life. My wife and I, we're fighting. Kids are a mess. I'm going to church. Okay, church is good. The Bible says we're supposed to meet together. That's a very good thing. New Life Church, very good thing. <laughs> right? But the one thing that you're supposed to do isn't to go to church so that you feel better, so that you can feel like you're a part of a family, so that you can be encouraged, so that you can be fed. Those are all things that happen at church, but that shouldn't be the reason why you go. The reason why you go is to connect with God and to find out what it is that He wants to speak to you and then... You apply it to your life. That's why you go to church. So be careful. Just, just going to church isn't enough to change you. It's not the one thing. It's not the one thing. What about prayer? Well, of course that should be the answer, right? Because prayer is talking with God. Bible quiz definition right there, right? You're, you're talking with God. Well, I know there's some of you out there that can have a conversation with somebody that's very one-sided. There's a lot of us who are pretty good at talking but not listening. We can walk in and we can say, hey, how's it going? And walk right by somebody. We can also do what we call prayer and go through our own little list of what we want and what we expect God to do and have no relationship, no connection, no intimacy. We're not listening we're going because we got some things to get out. God, I'm frustrated right now. You're not doing what I want you to do. I'm going to get it all out. And I'm, oh, I feel so good. That's not the one thing that's going to change you. But when you connect with God, when you draw near to Him, and prayer becomes about connecting with Him, 
That's when it begins to actually have value and change you. Oh, what about the Word? I read the Bible every day. I listen to it. I press play. Sometimes I play it at two and a half speed just to get through, so it's really fast. <laughs> Those of you people on version get what that means, right? I've done my devotions, in and out, five minutes flat, nailed it. I got a few memorized. So the one thing, I, the one thing that I need to do when I feel, I just, I got to spend more time in the Word. I'm telling you, time in the Word is powerful. It's important. But it's not the one thing that's going to change you. Until you know the author of this word, then it's just words on a page. It's good ideas. It's history. It's a story. But when you know the one who wrote it and you go to him, then suddenly that comes alive. Well, I know the one thing that's missing in my life. I know I've been feeling guilty about it. I don't tithe. I don't give my money. I, I know, I'm sure if I just, everything would just fix because I know that if you give money, you get money. So I need to give money because I need some money. And so I'm going to start giving. And what's, what's that number I have to do? Oh yeah, it's 10%. Okay, so I'm going to do that 10% thing. I haven't done it. I'm going to try it for one week. And that's probably going to be the one thing that's going to fix everything because I know it's the one thing I'm missing. I'm doing all the rest, Right? But are you kind of getting how we think sometimes? We're so selfish in our motivations. We're so religious in the way we do things. Yes, when you give, you get. But as soon as you give to get, you've got the wrong motives. So if that's all you're doing and you think that's going to be the answer, do you want to know how many people I know where when they, when they just like, ah, I don't know. They go and they give money and they help somebody. And then they walk away and they feel really good for a while because I gave some money, but then that feeling goes away. So then they got to give something else and they got to do something else. It's the heart connect. When you understand that everything you have belongs to him and the reason why we tithe and the reason why we give is just to honor him and acknowledge where it came from. And we're thankful and we understand that we can do more with God's hand on our 90% than his hand not on our 100%. You, you see the connection there? So the one thing you have to do is you have to go to the Lord. James 4.8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So all of these things are good, but only when they flow out of relationship. If they don't flow out of relationship and intimacy, it's a whole bunch of religious works, and it's not going to produce the fruit in your life that you want. Thank you, Zach. Here's what it says in Psalms, chapter 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything. There's that thing again. Anything in me that offends you. I love that translation. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. Do you know why it's so important to get near to God? Because you'll never hear his voice unless you do. Unless you're near, you won't hear. You'll just start guessing what you what you think he's trying to say. You'll start guessing what it is you're supposed to do. You'll start guessing what his plan is. You'll start trying by trial and error to figure out Christianity. I'm telling you, that is a hard road to take. But when you draw near to God, and when you do it on his terms, I tell you, it absolutely changes things. And so the rich young ruler got that concept. He got the first step right. Here's the next step. He thought, it was, he thought it was just going to be one thing. That's several one things. There, there, there's several one things that we need in our life. So there's one thing we need to do. And then according to, to Jesus, when he was talking to the rich young ruler, there was one thing he lacked. Here's what it says. 
in Mark 10, 21. And Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, you lack one thing. So go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. So Jesus pointed out the one thing that he was lacking. But there's something you got to understand about this rich young ruler. For as much as I can tell from the scriptures, he's probably initially one of the only people who has a loving encounter with Jesus that goes away worse than than when he met Jesus. Think about that. Because he came to Jesus wanting something fixed, wanting eternal life, wanting to have that, that peace that was missing in his heart filled. Jesus tells him what it is, and then he refuses to do it. He wasn't willing, or at least as far as the scripture says, we, we don't know about the rest of his life. Maybe something did happen. Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, all right, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. That's a good verse, but it's in the wrong place. We'll just roll with it. We'll make it apply right there. So here's the deal. We need to be willing to ask God, what is that one thing? What is that one thing that needs to change in my life? Now, why is this so important? Because here's the deal. Whatever that one thing is, it's taking up place. It might be taking up natural place. It might be taking up emotional place. It might be taking up mental space. It might be taking up financial space. Whatever the one thing you're lacking, it's taking up space in your life. And until you're willing to say, all right, God, I'm laying it down. There's not going to be room. It's like you have a puzzle and you're trying to jam the wrong piece in there. Anybody ever done that? <laughs> I'm going to make this fit because it's the right colors. It's, uh, it's just a little, I'm going to make this piece fit. No, you've got to be willing to absolutely lay it down. The story of Mary and Martha, Luke chapter 10, verses 41 and 42. The Lord says to Martha, 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 you are anxious and you are troubled about many things. So she had more than one to deal with. (laughs) She had a lot of things, right? About many things. Oh, but wait, but one thing is necessary. I love this. So again, he's, he's lining her up. One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion and that will not be taken away from her. So here's Mary, here's Martha. They both have an opportunity to connect and to love on Jesus. Martha gets wrapped up in doing the, doing the work, the cooking, the cleaning, doing all these good things. So she was so wrapped up in all the good things that she missed out on the best thing. So there was Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, feeling full and complete, and this is Awesome! Loving him, letting him love her. And there's Martha running around. That's never been me. (laughs) Running around and missing out on the best thing. You see, that's what happens when we're not willing to ask God, what's going on? Why do I feel the way I feel? Why am I acting the way I'm acting? Why am I carrying this grudge? Why am I carrying this anger? Why am I carrying this frustration? Why am I carrying this bitterness? What what is happening in me? Holy Spirit, show me. What's, What's the missing piece? What needs to change in my life? Is it friendships? Is it my job? Is it, what is it? What needs to change? And I've discovered something. James chapter two, verse 17 says, faith without works is dead. In other words, if there's not action to what you're doing, then it's not real faith. I've discovered that most people can only handle talking about something so long or declaring there's something for so long, and then if they don't actually do it or become it, they just get so frustrated. 
You can only say, I'm a Christian, and not live according to God's standards for so long until it's finally going to become such a thorn in your flesh. You're going to get so miserable because you want to do it and you're not doing it. You want to quit it, this and you're not. You want to be here and you're not. You want to invest, but you're not. You keep saying you're going to, but you don't. You can only handle that for so long. And that's honestly where the rubber meets the road for a lot of people. That's where a lot of people walk away from the church and walk away from God because they've just decided it's too hard. Is it hard? Oh, absolutely. If you try and do it all in one shot. That's why I love the way Jesus said it. There's one thing you lack. If you want that to me speaks, that's like, okay, you just need to take this first step. <laughs> you need to take this first step. What, what's the one step that God is asking you to do? You can think about joining a gym all you want. You can think about it. You can talk about it. You can get three buddies together. We're all going to join. Until somebody actually puts money on the table, you're never going. First step is put some money, right? Take that step. Sign up. So then you go. <laughs> I remember reading about this one guy. He had so much weight to lose, and it was overwhelming to him. So he just went, and he, he went to the gym every day. Walked in, sat at a machine, did one rep and left. And he did that for like a couple weeks because he just wanted to get in the habit and the rhythm of going. He wanted to become someone who goes to the gym. <laughs> Wasn't doing anything yet, but he's going to the gym. He's taking a step in the right direction. He's beginning to do what's in his heart to do. And I'm telling you, I believe that when God speaks to your heart and he shows you the one thing that's lacking, it's that one next super important step you need to take to be where God wants you to be. And the thing about a step is it's momentum. And one step leads to the next. It's like it's natural. One step leads to the next. And the danger is if you don't take a step, that's usually where you end up doing something absolutely foolish. When you have no purpose and you're wasting your time and you're sitting around and have nothing better to do, so you get on your phone or you go shopping or you do something really dumb. Because you're not taking a step in the right direction. So you've got to start by taking a step. Set yourself up to be who God's called you to be. Act on what he speaks to your heart. And then here's the third thing that I see in this. There's actually only one thing that you need to change. And I've already alluded to it, but it's simply this. It's your focus. There's probably at least one thing you need to do, but really, the thing you need to change is your focus. Mark 10, 21, Jesus looked at the rich young ruler. It says he loved him and he said to him, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. Shift your focus. He's saying, take your focus off you, take your focus off your money, take your focus off your position, and focus in on me. That's where most of us totally get it wrong. Maybe we begin to take the steps towards the Lord. We're spending time with him, we're connecting with him, we're getting some of this right, we're listening to his voice, but I'm telling you, once you do those things, the next step, the next one thing you need to do is make sure that you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. I love 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. It says this. It says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. This sounds like purpose here. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, even though I'm not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. This sounds really confusing because you, be, you can't be both, right? He says, I do this to win those not having the law. To the weak, I'm weak to win the weak. And then he says, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. So this is the shift of focus that we need to have in our life. 
where suddenly everything revolves around Jesus and what is it you want me to do? Who is it you want me to reach? What is that thing I need to do to connect relationally with that person to share the love of God with them? I have become all things so that by all means I may win some. It's this heart motive where suddenly my life is, is not about just me. You spent enough time with God that you are head over heels in love with him, that you want to share of the goodness that you've received. You've let him speak to your heart. You're not walking around empty. You're full. And because you're full, you have something to offer. So then you go out into the world and you start sharing God with people. Doing whatever you can, whatever thing you can do, whatever means you can find to love on and to reach people. And I tell you, when you start living that way, that's when you absolutely begin to come alive. And I want to close with this last verse. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything. <laughs> everything. That's, that, that, that's one where you can start putting a, a name to it. What are all those things you need to throw off? Everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right, at the throne of God, at the right hand of the throne of God. So he, here, here's how I want to close today. It's really simple. I really believe that there's one thing that is holding every single one of us back from taking the next step into God's plan for our life. Unless you're the person in here who feels absolutely 100% fulfilled, complete, everything's amazing, there's something. It may be sin, it may not. That's why I said everything that hinders you. There's something that's stopping you from being who God's called you to be. So I want us to stand up in this place today. And we're going to take a moment, just a minute or two. Maybe only a minute. Because here's the deal. When you ask somebody a question and they know the answer, it doesn't take them long to tell you. <laughs> When you ask God to show you the one thing, the one thing right now that you need to change, you need to let go of, or the one piece you need to add, the, the one thing that you need to get rid of to make room in your life for God, I believe he's going to speak it clear as day. There'll be no question because that's the way God is. That's the way he works. So I'm going to pray. And when I'm done praying, they're going to start singing. And I just want you to ask God that question. Say, Holy Spirit, show me. Show me that one thing, that one step that I need to take, that one thing that I need to change. And then as the music keeps going, then just make it a declaration. You and God have a moment this morning. Father God, I thank you so much for your love. God, your love has been poured into our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you would begin to speak to our hearts. God, you would, you would clearly speak whatever that one thing is right now that we need to change or let go of. God, so that we can walk away better than when we came, more equipped to be who you've called us to be. So speak to hearts right now in Jesus' name. Now just take a moment and connect with the Lord.
Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. God, I just thank you. God, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your love. And Lord, I believe that you've spoken to hearts this morning in this place. And God, as they have made the decision to lay down whatever it is that they need to lay down, to change whatever it is that they need to change, I ask right now, God, that you would begin to flood their hearts and their minds and their lives with the fullness of who you are. God, that there would be no lack, that there would be no emptiness, that there would be no fear, no worry, nor doubt. God, that you would just consume every part of who they are so that their light can begin to shine brighter and brighter than ever before. God, that we we would leave this place and go into this world with a new purpose, God. The purpose that you've created us for. The good works that you've called us to do. And that we would begin to turn Billings, Montana and the rest of this world upside down for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're in this place, you need prayer for anything. You feel free to come to the altar. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, that is the first step in this incredible adventure. Come and talk to us. We'd love to do that. Otherwise, go and be full of the love of God. Have a great day.